asked Anita, um, meant to provide some context of sustainability and be really focused towards clinicians. The title, Do No Harm, is a nod to the Hippocratic Oath um, and everything that you do in the service of people's health. But in the context of the planet's health, we cannot simply do no harm. We all as individuals and communities much uh, need to do much, much more. Sorry, I went one more. Okay, so just um, uh, I wanted to provide a little bit of a sense of, of what we, what I wanted to speak about um, today. So wanted to, um, first of all, kind of let's sketch out kind of the issue, um, the problem. Uh, I thought it would be worthwhile to um, provide a little bit of a brief um, overview of some of the sustainability frameworks that are often used in design and construction. Thought it would be helpful to um, provide some regional context and specifically I'm, I'm really sort of talking about Ontario and British Columbia a little bit and in, and in the context of the latter there um, would like to introduce the idea of, of climate change and resiliency and, and the latter part of that being uh, I think really quite important um, the topic that we think about uh, when we're planning and designing healthcare facilities. Uh, and then a little bit of looking to the future, what's happening now. And then lastly, I thought it would be really important for clinicians, you as advocates, understanding what, at least in Ontario, what the Ministry of Health capital planning uh, toolkit, what the capital planning stages are, so that you can apply your advocacy and really sort of be thinking um, very proactively. Okay. Okay. So this graphic, we've likely all seen sort of variations on the red representing areas of the planet that have been warming the fastest due to greenhouse gas emissions. This is a collective problem that we all need to overcome. And if greenhouse gases are the major contributor to our planet warming and causing really our climate crisis, these figures I think are really alarming. The healthcare sector in the US contributes approximately 10% of its greenhouse gas emissions. I think that I became aware of this figure a little over a year ago, and I was stunned by the fact that the world's largest economy, the sector whose mission is to care for people, contributes one tenth of its greenhouse gas emissions. Ultimately, it's hurting the health of the planet. So the the goal of this discussion is, as I said, not to talk in technical terms, but to outline or, or to outline a prescriptive pathway to designing sustainable hospitals. It's meant to provide some context so that nurses, doctors, and other clinicians can be advocates in demanding our hospitals and healthcare facilities be more sustainable, promote community well-being, and be more obviously and more obviously demonstrate really leadership in the climate change crisis. You know, for me, inherently, hospitals are the most civic of building types. They are the anchors of communities, whether urban or rural, downtown or in the suburbs. And given that hospitals are the workplace of so many people and serve the people of those communities through the best and the worst of situations shouldn't they be more explicitly models of health and well-being? When I was thinking about this, um, uh, this talk, I was imagining a doctor, yourself, Anita, um, uh, as you are working at a hospital that's planning a new facility and asking the question of your um, VP of Capital Planning and Redevelopment, is our new hospital going to be sustainable? And I imagine that the response could be, as simple as, yes, we're gonna be lead, but what does that mean? And I think uh, the real issue here is we have to figure out what sustainability means to us as individuals and as organizations committed to promoting health and wellness. And specifically, I think that you all will each need to figure out what being sustainable means in your organizations. Perhaps like diagnosing a patient, each of your organizations will have its own individual cultures, which may color how you define sustainability slightly differently than another. You know, is it about making buildings that use less energy, reduce carbon dioxide emissions, use less water, have better indoor air quality? Does climate adaptability play a role? 
Is it about enhancing occupant well-being? When we talk about sustainability, it's a broad question that can be defined very differently. And with that, I'm going to provide just a little bit of a high-level um, overview of a couple of sustainability fra uh, frameworks that we have in place. So LEED. LEED certification is really the, um, lar uh, the most uh, significantly recognized, globally recognized a symbol of a, a sustainability achievement and leadership. LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's really the uh, probably the most pervasive inter, uh, international um, uh, icon of sustainability excellence. The first version of LEED was formulated in 1998 by the U.S. Uh, Green Building Council, which was founded just five years earlier. And so in the scheme of things, it's actually quite recent, um, particularly when we think about hospitals um, when we typically design them, we're designing them, thinking of them as really being 100 year basic sort of 100 year structures with a design service life of about 50 or 60 years. Um, LEED addresses um, these overarching sustainability goals that you can see on the slide by way of its framework that doesn't simply focus on one element of a building, such as energy or water or materials. Rather, it looks at the whole picture, factoring in all of the critical elements that work together to create a well-designed, sustainable project. What I think is really important here uh, to note and to be aware of is that LEED really focuses on the building the thing as a piece of infrastructure. It doesn't focus on the operational aspects of the building. So LEED promotes the achievement of those overarching goals that we just saw by breaking building and site performance down into these six categories. Um, and I would say that by setting targets and measuring energy efficiency, it furthers reduction of carbon emissions. That by using uh, low VOC materials in the building, one is enhancing indoor environmental quality and therefore improving individual human health. So it starts to sort of break down into, into more detail, um, but it's, it's real sort of goals are those um, higher level goals that we saw in the previous slide. Okay, so this is an image of a lead scorecard. And uh, this represents how a project scores relative to the performance areas that we just saw, the six performance areas. Uh, location and transportation, sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy and atmosphere, materials and resources, indoor um, environmental uh, quality. And then there's there's now been two um, sort of added categories for innovation and regional priorities. The smaller text under each of those sort of headings indicates credits, and each credit has an allocation of points. And so uh, by this measure, the more points that a project achieves, the higher performing it is from a sustainability perspective. Um, if we look at, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, location and transportation. The building entry is within 400 or 800 meters of an existing or planned transit stop. Project can achieve up to four points or five points, excuse me. And that's really about the promotion of public transit again, kind of not relying on the car so much and ultimately uh, towards that goal of, of reducing greenhouse gases. Projects pursuing LEED certification earn points depending on their scores in the performance categories based on the number of points achieved. A project can earn one of four LEED um, levels, certified silver, gold, and platinum. And there's quite a bit of documentation that's required for a submission and ultimately it's reviewed by the green building council um, their review team um, looks at all of the backup supporting documentation and the corresponding certification level is then achieved here's something that's quite different the well building standard and if you i think it it, it speaks kind of volume if you, if you just read the statement the well building standard is a roadmap for creating and certifying spaces that advance human health and well-being. Bit of a different uh, focus here in that it's, it's less on or less focused just on the infrastructure of the building itself. It actually goes to the people and the operations of the facility. 
So these are the um, uh, founding principles of, of well. And as you can see, um, equitable benefits all types of people, especially those who need it the most. Um, global provides solutions that are applicable in countries around the world. Evidence-based, technically robust, resilient. I thought this one's an interesting principle from the perspective of it evolves over time to incorporate new research and new information. Um, ultimately, um, you know, well is like um, lead. It's independently verified. It's a performance-based system um, for measuring and certifying these features of how the built environment impacts on human health and well-being. So again, there's that slightly different sort of focus. And where um, LEAD had six uh, performance categories, um, uh, WELL has 10. And um, air, water, thermal, comfort, light, movement, nourishment, sound mind, body, <laughs> sound mind, community, and material. So the program helps organizations monitor ongoing building performance and collect employee feedback, enabling them to take a data-driven approach to their health and well-being efforts. So these 10 concepts are applied in support of well-being. This is a holistic look at how well-being becomes cultural. We're not simply talking about a facility on a site, what it's made of, how it performs. It's not just the sort of bricks and mortar well takes into account a really a whole life perspective. As an example, under the sound concept, there are requirements relating to designing for sound, limiting maximum sound levels, designing for reverberation times and spaces to enhance their effectiveness, um, sound masking to improve uh, individual privacy, sense of privacy. Under the nourishment concept, if you have a cafeteria or a food servery, one of the preconditions is a requirement for fruit and vegetable to be offered for sale or provided. And it even speaks to how you would promote the visibility of fruits, literally where they are to be placed and how they are to be positioned. So there's even a point associated with um, uh, promoting healthy portions that speaks to a requirement for the maximum size of plates, bowls, and cups. Under the concept of mind, there are two points for developing a stress management plan. There's a point for supporting healthy working hours. There's a point for providing a restorative space. Under community, there's a point to promote community engagement where employees are given paid time off to participate in volunteer activities for a registered charity or nonprofit. So it's really quite a different sort of perspective and focus than, than certainly lead. And, but similar to lead, um, there, are, um, there are sort of levels and there are points associated depending on uh, what points uh, an organization or a project would choose to um, uh, target. Um, and ultimately, in order to be able to demonstrate compliance with the program requirements, projects like lead submit documentation, it's evaluated by te and tested by a third party and then ultimately um, a well certification um, is, is awarded. I added this little uh, news clipping. I thought it was, it was obviously topical and, and I thought interesting. So um, some of you may have heard of uh, uh, Niagara Health System, have a new Niagara, Health, uh, Niagara South Hospital. Um, I think it's still in procurement, uh, hasn't been awarded yet, um, but this came out a little while ago that Niagara Health um, were um, uh, moving towards, uh, working towards, they had been registered and they were working towards uh, being the first well-certified hospital in Canada. Just for some context, thought that would be interesting. You know, and if we look at Ontario uh, a little bit more, I think it's had a very successful program of building new healthcare infrastructure over the last 50 years. If you go on the Infrastructure Ontario website and uh, look at just the healthcare uh, projects, there's over 50, 50 new projects that have been completed in the last 15 years. That's not including say Niagara South, which is actually um, in procurement. Um, in Ontario, as a benchmark, LEED Silver 
is the minimum sustainability requirement for uh, current hospital construction. So what that means is each project must accumulate points that it prioritizes to achieve that minimum lead silver point threshold of 50 points. In the context of meeting capital cost budgets, and in the absence of an articulated sustainability vision, this can become more of an accounting exercise rather than one with a larger meaning. And I think that's important context for everyone to be aware of. This graph, courtesy of Greening Healthcare, who have a number of member hospitals from which they request data points on energy use, usage in the facilities. So these are all new facilities built in the last 15 years. All the, of these projects would have been built to at least a lead silver standard. And there's a couple of facilities, at least uh, one, I think there's two actually, that would have achieved uh, lead gold. Um, what this graph is showing uh, is the potential for energy savings. So the ones at the top of the graph are doing very well. They are achieving their full energy savings potential um, as um, Greening Healthcare established a benchmark. Um, the ones at the bottom of the graph are not achieving um, their potential energy savings. So the point of this um, diagram here is that lead silver doesn't necessarily mean that a facility is going to achieve high energy savings or be more uh, sustainable necessarily. So as most of you will recognize, here's an image of an operating room. Uh, operating rooms require ventilation that changes the volume of the air in the room 20 times every hour. That's fresh outdoor air, not recirculated. And so there's a lot of energy required to get all of that air to the correct temperature and humidity level. Should that requirement be changed? No. From an infection control perspective, it's fundamental to the well-being of people and the services that are being um, performed there. But when it's empty and it's not uh, scheduled to be in use, does it need to provide uh, or operate at 20 air changes per hour? No. And when I spoke to Ian Jarvis at Greening Healthcare, and we were talking about the, uh, the graph that we were just looking at, he was saying that one of the biggest differentiators of performance of those hospitals was the aggressiveness of certain facilities to actively control the environment of spaces within the hospital. So for example, not providing 20 air changes per hour to the ORs when they're not in use or not scheduled to be in use, essentially dialing it back to the minimum um, uh, building standards. It seems pretty simple. And it's about really having the building automation control systems and actively programming them to save on energy usage. While Ontario has uh, the minimum benchmark of lead silver, uh, for new healthcare facilities. In British Columbia, it's lead gold, and it has been for a number of years. I'm not necessarily trying to set up another uh, East versus West kind of competition, but I do believe that it's more indicative of proactive position on environmental action. Uh, and more on that point, in 2020, the BC government developed the Climate Resilience Guidelines for BC Health Facility Planning and Design. It was developed by an industry task force the resilience guidelines apply to all new construction, major redevelopments um, valued at anything over $2 million, so actually quite small. It requires that every project undergo a climate risk assessment, which identifies hazards such as extreme heat, wildfires, poor air quality and smoke, severe storms, high winds, flooding, earthquakes. Importantly, though this exercise is really a facilitated conversation about the likelihood of such extreme events, the potential impact that they could have on the healthcare facility to continue its operation and how those challenges might be mitigated. It basically asks the question, if we think about the design of the facility and the operations to overcome, can we overcome those potential risk impacts? At the root of climate resilience guidelines, is not the prevention of the extreme events, but whether early thinking about their risks and the impact can be undertaken early in design so that the facility ultimately is more adaptable. And that is really the, the root of, of uh, resilience, it's adaptability strategies. 
climate models into the future, all indicating that, say, Vancouver is getting much hotter and drier at a fairly significant rate. The resilience guidelines would ask, so what's the impact of that on design and operations? And can we start to address it now in design? Current healthcare projects in British Columbia are asking architects and engineers to design to 2050 climate data. And for the design to be able to accommodate the 2080 projected data. So it just basically would say that in a facility designed towards 2050, but make allowances, say for space, if more um, ventilation uh, was required, that that space is there for those units to be able to be placed. They also undertake some exercises during the design stage to ask, so what would the capital cost expenditure be to achieve net zero energy usage? Or another um, um, uh, test or uh, exercise is for a 3% capital cost increase, what would the energy savings um, be achieved? What energy savings could be achieved? And I think in, uh, and I've just recently um, uh, been working on a project in, in Vancouver, and I was really encouraged by the conversation around embodied carbon. So that's carbon that is embodied in the physical building itself. So in healthcare in Ontario, in Canada, actually, the biggest culprit on this front um, from our build, uh, physical building infrastructure is concrete. It's the high cost of uh, high, highest cause of embodied carbon in buildings. But technology is evolving and low carbon concrete is being developed and starting to come to market. And I just saw a post about three days ago on LinkedIn that was sort of shouting out the success um, on the construction of the new St. Paul's Hospital, very large project in Vancouver for utilizing low carbon concrete. Um, I think the, the shout out was there was there was one long sort of poor day. Um, there was almost 4,000 cubic meters of concrete poured and uh, the material that they used was the equivalent of uh, taking 265 cars off the road um, for a year. So I think this question needs to also starts to ask whether or not we need to build buildings out of concrete and steel with mass timber being the um, alternative. And while that's gonna take some time to um, be applicable for hospitals, and there's very good reasons for that, um, what I think it's asking us is it's forcing the question about whether some types of non-acute care facilities could be constructed of wood and then um, uh, really start to address that question around embodied carbon in buildings. So um, looking ahead, in some respects, it's looking ahead, but it's it's looking at things that are happening um, elsewhere in the world right now. Um, the National Health Service in the United Kingdom has a goal to be the world's first national net zero health service. So for emissions that they control directly, they are targeting to be net zero by 2040. For emissions that they can indirectly control, meaning their whole complete supply chain, they're targeting to be net zero by 2045. This is a massively huge goal. Um, the graphic um, on the right-hand side there introduces the idea of scope one, two, and three emissions. I'm not an expert on this, but basically uh, scope one would represent those emissions that result directly from hospital operations and that you've got control over. Scope two uh, would be say emissions that um, uh, suppliers to a hospital um, would have control over. And scope three is the whole extended supply chain that contributes to the really the ecosystem of, of the hospital or the facility. There's already reports um, indicating that uh, the NHS is not going to meet this um, uh, target without some extremely urgent action. Um, uh, I think the current um, greenhouse gas reductions are falling at a rate of about 1% a year. They need to be at 8%. However, I think you have to um, really sort of think about whether setting that standard as they did in 2020, that in 20 years time, the whole um, NHS was scope one uh, emissions were going to be net zero, um, was really the start of some urgent action. It was setting a new standard. And so, you know, how does the quote go? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. 
I guess, you know, we'll see how it, how it sort of pans out. Um, I think we're fortunate to be the beneficiaries of a universally funded healthcare system, albeit under the direction of the provinces, but maybe we would also do well to have such a similar audacious kind of target as the NHS. Um, here's something I think that's pretty interesting closer to home. And again, some of you may have seen this in, in the news or in your social media streams. University Health Network has initiated a really interesting project that will use the heat differential um, from wastewater to supply low carbon heating and cooling to the uh, Toronto Western Hospital campus. Um, currently, this is being noted as the world's largest application of this technology. It's estimated that it will be able to supply 90% of the hospital's heating and cooling requirements. And over 30 years, it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 250,000 tons. This has been supported by UHN, the City of Toronto, Van City Community Investments, and the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. Um, so just as an example from our previous uh, discussion, the NHS, this would really represent scope one um, uh, direct emissions. I think this is a really interesting project that many other hospital organizations um, will be watching very closely. Okay, um, advocacy. There are six stages by which all major projects proceed through the Ministry of Health in Ontario. That is, there are six distinct review and, and review and approval milestones. So for all the clinicians in the audience, this is what your facilities and executive teams navigate to shepherd a project into construction. It's a very involved process involving many people and many, many hours of effort. And I thought it would be important just to understand a little bit at a high level where your advocacy can be best applied if you understood the process a little bit. So stage one master program, master plan really explores the medical program, service planning, infrastructure, broad picture stuff. This looks at existing service levels, uh, like how many day surgeries uh, you might be doing, um, uh, looks at the facilities catchment area, its projected demographics, and starts to project where service volumes might be in future timeframes, 10 years out, 20 years out. That's the program part. The master plan part would speak to um, uh, the physical infrastructure of the hospital. It would make assessments as to the condition of the building, if it's an existing building, the viability of the, of the building to be able to support the proposed program. And if a new program is being added to an existing hospital, it will consider existing, existing program adjacencies and whether or not they can support um, an efficient service delivery. If it's a new hospital on a greenfield site, there would be other considerations, uh, traffic flows, parking, utilities, all that sort of large, larger sort of site stuff. Um, and part of any of these stage um, uh, submissions is a cost estimate um, that would align with the requisite sort of level of detail. And we go um, higher level detail at stage one, obviously then through into more detail as we get towards um, stage four. Stage two is functional program. This is now um, uh, where space, for the um, targeted programs is really being defined at a room by room level. Um, stage three, preliminary design. And, and it seems like an awful lot has happened until we get to when we talk about something called design, but this is where walls are drawn, not as a conceptual line, but something that is sort of thickness, has intent, has materiality. Uh, stage four working drawings. So that was that's really detailed design. So that's really um, uh, drawings and specifications, documentation that ultimately will go out to bid and and be utilized for the construction um, of the facility. And by the time you get to stage five, well, now you're building. Um, if you're in a facility that's contemplating a major project. You know, where is the best time to advocate for environmental action? To question, um, to advocate for your definition of sus sustainability. I think that if you're waiting until, say, stage three, it's too long. It may seem like it's the most relevant time because that's where design is, is really sort of being considered um, uh, in, a, in a very comprehensive way. 
But the reality is, and as I mentioned, um, this is a, a very linear kind of process. It has a cost estimate established with each um, stage. And there's a review and approval um, with each stage. And so at stage one, at the very beginning, that's when project vision is really established. And if sustainability is important and part of that project vision, and it becomes articulated um, more clearly in stage one, then it has a better chance of, I think, being at a much higher level and ultimately, um, I think, um, achieving the kind of uh, sort of performance and I think the sort of audacious targets that we're really sort of thinking about and we're trying to figure out how we can how we can uh, bring to our healthcare facilities. So, um, you know, and I, if an understanding of how all of our existing facilities can start actively um, considering because I realize that I've sort of this is very much biased towards major sort of new um, buildings uh, and construction. But I think that doesn't stop us from thinking about any sort of existing hospital and healthcare facility and really thinking about, well, what does sustainability mean to us? Um, you know, how can we start to actively um, think about this? And perhaps, Miles, um, uh, I've just given you a little bit of a of a um, idea for uh, for the next um, peach webinar topic and that's all i have i'm i'd be really happy to um answer some uh questions if anyone has them thanks for your time thank you stuart uh i am miles Sargent. i am one of uh several uh peaches here tonight and I just want to start by saying a few thank yous. I want to say thank you to the coalition for partnering on this webinar, uh, in particular, Autumn, Kent, and Neil. I also want to say that this uh, whole idea was sort of inspired by Anita Rao and David Rosen, who are both with Trillium Health Partners six months ago, who started to ask the question, what could they do about the build uh, that Trillium is, is doing? Is it too late to... Uh, change the process. Um, and finally, of course, thank you, Stuart. That was an excellent uh, presentation. I really enjoyed that. I've got a whole bunch of questions here, but hey, it's not about me. Um, does anyone else have any questions? And if so, please put them in the, uh, the Q&A. And maybe I'll start out with uh, what might be one of the most relevant questions, because again, this, this topic came from Trillium, although I have heard from the Niagara folks and, and various other uh, hospitals in, in Ontario that have new builds coming up. But where is Trillium at in the planning stage um, and uh, what could still be done? And I, and I guess the bottom line is, are they aiming for lead silver as it stands right now or what are they, what are they aiming for? Um, so, yeah, so uh, I, I mean, uh, Trillium is, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the, the RFQ is out. Um, uh, the Sorry, that's the request for qualifications for design build teams um, uh, to uh, design and build the, the, the new hospital. Um, uh, in terms of sustainability, I'm not 100% um, sure if it's uh, lead silver, um, if it's gone more than that. I should also say that, I mean, often, um, there may be lead silver, and then there will be um, specific sort of energy level, um, uh, energy and um, energy usage um, targets um, that that kind of run parallel. I mean, they're not sort of um, they're not they're not um, really separated from say just lead silver in that they are contributing points that might be lead silver. But I would say that for sure that's going to be the minimum. Um, whether it's more than that, I'm, I'm just not um, uh, part of that project team and that information is, um, is essentially confidential, I think. Um, although maybe it's actually, I sh I, you know what, I didn't even check on the website because um, they do have a, uh, you know, pretty good information on the website. Okay, um, I have a first question here. 
uh, what is your best estimate for how much a facility budget should be for lead certification? Uh, example, 20% premium to be silver. I appreciate it depends on what you choose, but is there a rule of thumb? The budget is what this needs to be balanced by, and that is hard to balance. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of interpreting that to mean that if, if you're to build a basic building, how much more does it cost to be lead silver? I hope I've got that right. Yeah, I would, I would yeah. say that uh, honestly, lead silver is, is not a, um, it really doesn't represent an addition in cost. It's, it's now the baseline, is it not? I remember you saying to me, yes, Stuart, that in 2005, it came out and even at 2005, um, I mean, it was, it was very good in 2005. It wasn't necessarily uh, as high as it might've been. I don't wanna misquote you, uh, but now there are certainly higher levels that you could go to like gold and platinum. And actually, I don't know if you said much about platinum, uh, Stuart, like if you were to go all the way up to gold or platinum, how much more does that cost? Oh, um, yeah. Okay. So I'm not, so certainly we've, we've, we've got, um, completed, um, hospital facilities that are legal. Um, so far, I'm just, I'm, uh, thinking off the top. I, I'm not, not aware of a of a lead platinum hospital. Certainly not in Canada. Um, I don't believe that there's one in the United States. Um, um, but in many respects, um, and and that's where I, th I, I, I th there's a few things that have changed. I think so. Lead. There's a lot of success. I think to lead in terms of kind of it's the thinking that it has um, uh, engendered. And um, what I think though that has changed over the last sort of 10 to 15 years is, you know, where's the sort of priority on how we define sustainability? And, you know, I, so I think like the um, Niagara South um, aiming to be the first well certified, I think is an interesting take. I mean, it's like I said, it becomes, I think a very um, individual sort of question that needs to be answered at sort of at an organization's, um, you know, at their sort of cultural level. And that's where I think that the advocacy by clinicians, I think is, is, is really great because you can really sort of drive that. I mean, it is your workplace, but um, as I pointed out, I mean, I really honestly believe that there is, um, uh, you know, that hospitals, like I said, are, are the sort of most civic of, of building types. And with that, I think becomes a kind of, there's a responsibility and an accountability. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a few questions coming in here. Um, John Stevenson, do you see UHN replicating the Western wet project downtown where it is currently served by natural gas fired steam from N-Wave Energy Corporation? Can you see them telling N-Wave to either do this for them or they'll do it for themselves? Um, uh, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm totally following that. Um, so the, um, uh, the, the, the wet, um, project, um, mm -hmm. is meant to supply that heating and cooling load to the new campus. Um, uh, and what, I'm not sure if the comment was on, um, just in, re in reference to N-Wave. Not sure if I've got yeah, that. So, yeah, so again, so yeah, do you see UHN replicating the Western wet project downtown where it is currently served by natural gas fired steam? So I guess there's another site downtown using natural gas fired steam and wondering if that could be switched over as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the goal is, um, like I say, to that the campus will, I guess, yeah, switch over ultimately with the, with that project. Okay, uh, next question uh, from Douglas Thompson. Just got to get up to it here. Okay, we do not have much active engagement in our hospital in spite of a core active group. Could we get more help externally to motivate or embarrass hospitals into action? Or how would you go about dealing with this issue? 
maybe university hospitals could take the lead. I think that, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the example projects, right? Um, uh, the UHN wet, um, the wet project, wastewater energy transfer project, I think it will be an example. And like I say, I think it, it will serve um, other facilities are going to be um, watching it to see um, how that actually transpires. And ultimately, um, uh, at, at some level, I believe that there's, um, I mean, look, healthcare facilities are challenged on so many different fronts. Um, <clears throat> I think the, you know, we've all got the benefit. We are, like I said, we're all the beneficiaries of a universally funded healthcare system. And um, in my, uh, and this is only my sort of perspective, um, we ought to be able to take the longer view um, on things and investment. Um, that's not always the easiest path. And I think, you know, ultimately you need to be able to um, reconcile um, uh, providing services um, and something that may not necessarily add more services, but um, make the services that are provided more efficient, more sustainable, better for us all in the very long run. I don't know, that's, that's, a, that's a very personal sort of, um, sort of perspective on things. I mean, you know, I, this, this question makes me think of, uh, you know, the building we've discussed before, the, the building the city of Toronto is proposing to build that long-term care facility to be a zero carbon build. Um, Stuart, do you know how that is moving along at all? Um, still waiting. Okay. And what does it actually mean to be a zero carbon build? Is that, you know, can something actually be zero carbon or? Well, that's a good question. That's where, um, and that's a question that often are, um, you know, I, right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm only an architect. I'm not a sustainability expert. And I think, um, you know, our sustainability team and, and um, specialists would say, a client says, we want, we want to be net zero. What do you mean? Like, because do you mean net zero in terms of, uh, if you remember that slide, that scope one on say you're, you're going to have a new hospital and you want it to be scope one net zero, that would be the energy that it requires that it, that it is net zero. Is it then extending into like, what do we think about embodied carbon? Is the building like carbon zero? That is something different. That would, like I said, there's 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 all sorts of um, uh, challenges with that um, uh, in hospitals uh, in terms of mass timber. But I think um, so. That idea of of what do you mean when you say net zero is is a real question. Um, is it like you know the NHS is targeting scope one two three, so their entire ecosystem to be net zero. So any supplier who brings something, um, you, you know, that uh, supplies materials or whatnot to the any facility would effectively have to be net zero, right? That's a massive undertaking. That's why it is such a really massive undertaking. So I don't know if that answers your question. I think it, it's, about, it's about asking and answering the question, what do you mean by net zero? Yeah. Stuart, may I just ask along those lines, when we talk about net zero bills, there is a certain amount that can be offset, is my understanding, is how the National Health Service is, uh, is defining it. Is, is that achievable in Ontario and BC if we had a certain percentage of the embodied carbon, such as the concrete and the steel, to offset it in another way, say by... Um, providing renewable energy or trees and amortize that over time. Is that something we can do within our built environment? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And honestly, um, like, I don't feel particularly well equipped uh, to, to really sort of provide any kind of res uh, response to that. Um, yeah. 
good good topic for another for another webinar though. I mean, and, sorry, and I will, I'm going to give you one example as an example, Kaiser Permanente in the US. Um, so they're buying carbon credits um, to, to effectively try and make them as an organization net zero. And I'm not sure if that's kind of where you were maybe headed. Uh, um, you know, there's, there's, I think some people that would take a, um, um, a less generous sort of view of that. Right, they're sort of they're buying their way out. They're not acting. Okay, next question is from Miles Sargent, which is really interesting because I didn't actually type this one. So uh, there's another Miles Sargent <laughs> out there tonight. Um, is there a risk that government will reject a proposal if it becomes too expensive by making it well and lead certified? And that, that is a very interesting question. I mean, if 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 you know, name any hospital had decided to go let's say lead gold, lead platinum, and if it is an extra cost, who pays? Does the, does the government pay or, or how would that be covered? Um, well, we all pay, right? Sure. And that would be, that would be the, um, you know, that would be the, uh, I think the real sort of question around um, politics about sort of short-term view, long-term view, and not, only sort of um, making it sort of that sort of black and white because it, you know it's um, uh, do you want to pay more sort of capital cost um, in design and construction that has a longer sort of payback that may reduce greenhouse gases net zero etc whatever um, but are you willing to are you willing to sort of make that cost commitment up front? We may not really have a choice. Yeah. Right. That's kind of the point. But is it at a cost where um, you may not provide as many ORs? Just, you know, right. Fair enough. That's a real issue. Um, and so I don't, I'm not by any means, um, trying to sort of oversimplify it because it's not a it's not a simple um, uh, discussion for sure uh, I'm gonna skip over to the chat there's one question in the chat um, Roy Hamilton thank you Stuart lots to think about uh, adapting to my facility and it's only 16 years old I have done a little research on leads and well have you looked into ash ray as well mm -hmm. I ask because current educational programs I'm enrolled in refer to that standard quite often yeah so just I mean ash ray ash ray 90.1 and I'm not a mechanical engineer but um, uh, that would be the standard by which um, um, uh, say uh, we're looking at um, lead and we're looking at energy and at energy and atmosphere um, category energy optimization, um, you will gain um, uh, points by um, uh, the, the percentage that you are better than ASHRAE um, 90.1. So yes, it's, it's, it's a standard which is um, that lead and, and um, I think well um, use as a reference or as a benchmark. Okay, uh, which feeds into Mike Lithgow's question. Are there any other green building rating systems beside LEED and WELL that could be viable for a hospital new build? Um, I guess, um, yes, there are. Um, the question might be to what end? Fair enough. Um, uh, can I ask you a personal question? What, what is, what would you, if you're building a new hospital, Stuart, what, what, uh, what would you pick? Well, lead, what uh, level? Oh, uh, you know, so I've never, um, uh, uh, I've never been involved in a well um, registered project or a project that was um, aiming to achieve um, uh, well certification. I'm, I'm really on the outside, but I was, you know, this, this was a great sort of opportunity to kind of um, uh, educate myself a little bit more about it. Um, I think it's pretty interesting. I think it's very interesting perspective because it is this, it's not just about the sort of physical infrastructure and how that impacts on health and well-being, but it 
it very sort of proactively starts to um, um, get at um, behaviors ultimately. Um, and um, it forces, I think, uh, some questions that I think some organizations, it's just like I said, it's, it's maybe not in their culture. Um, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how, again, as another sort of thing that's out there that, um, you know, how Niagara uh, South um, does with it um, and how it has um, uh, ultimately will have impacted on, on, the, on, the, on the building and on the people because that's where it starts to become very different um, and it's very much focused on the people. Which I think is interesting. So, I, I guess I've I've evaded that a little bit in that um, um, I'm not going to get pinned down on a while yet. You know, uh, does the NHS use the same systems? Um, I'd, I'd look for anyone to um, uh, chip in and and uh, confirm this answer, but. Um, uh, in the UK, there's there's there is another sustainability system that's often referred to or often used, and it's called Bream. I don't really um, uh, know it or understand it um, all that well. So, um, if anyone uh, on the line knows more, I'd be interested. Okay, and the next question, Paul Castle. Thank you. Appreciate this free hospital and clinical spaces. Much of the GHG, in particular matter pollution, comes from upstream. Example, pharmaceutical manufacturing and packaging, et cetera. Do you see a role for hospitals, clinicians, and universities influencing the design, build, retrofit of these organizations? I have an answer for that, but I'll let you answer first. No, actually, I'm kind of interested in what you would say. Well, I, I would clinician. say that we, we do, and we're just starting to get into... Um, the procurement side of things, because as we've learned, uh, you know, the supply chain or uh, all the things that we use or consume in a healthcare facility represent 60, 65% of all our GHGs. And so it's up to us as hospitals to speak to the procurement agencies, which are partners and say, in your procurement scoring um, for vendors, and of course, 40% might be the cost of whatever you're buying and 40, 50% might be quality. Do you have 10% for sustainability? And that's what I think we should be aiming for. And, and these discussions are starting to happen. And of course that could be a game changer. So I think that it, I, I would say that, um, yeah, don't underestimate your advocacy, mm -hmm. right? whether it's hospital organizations and i think this is where this is really interesting um you know clinicians saying hang on um what's happening here right anita has something to add i um i just wanted to ask Stuart a couple of questions just regarding there are several hospital bills that are going to be started within the next 10 years in ontario as clinicians, what do you think are simple questions, maybe one or two questions that we can approach your master planning committee about to make sure that our voices are heard in wanting to have environmental sustainability spaces? How do we get our foot in the door into those committee meetings? Um, well, I guess, you know, this is where I think, um, um, establishing um as a healthcare organization i mean you're you're part of it right you're the, like you're an incredibly important part of it and i think um um kind of putting the hand up i gotta believe putting the hand up and saying hang on um does our hospital have a sustainability vision right is it articulated because i think that um that's where I've seen a few projects. Look, I mean, there's all sorts of, I think, um, um, instances of some really sort of positive initiatives and positive direction, no question. And I think um, even we look at sort of what's been uh, constructed in Ontario, and I think, I mean, there's a lot of 
um, there's a lot of uh, facilities that are that are doing well. Um, could they do better? Um, and there's and there's definitely some that could be doing much better, and they are improving. I, I mean, I appreciated um, Ian Jarvis kind of um, giving me you know some indication of facilities that are noticeably over sort of um, a few years are really sort of improving um, their energy efficiency. But I guess that's kind of it comes back to that, you know, and it will start with I think like you Anita, what do you think? What do you, what do you want? From a from a, what do you think about sustainability? What do you think um, your organization? What what should their position um, be, um, and how does it start to um, look at not just new builds, um, but like existing exist like your existing operations? So it goes to that supply chain question. Um, I know that you're obviously um, you know very uh, focused on. Um, um uh some of your uh, anesthetic sort of gases and whatnot that that are pretty harmful um and are there alternatives and i think all of that is is about starts to map out like i say a sort of a sustain a position on sustainability and so you know is there a committee on um environmental and sustainability issues in your organization I'm going to guess probably, um, uh, you know, and, and then it's it's stepping up and it's starting to sort of be a part of the conversation and, and starting to um, have a voice and really shaping it. That's what I believe. Maybe I'm naive. I'm, I'm just going to jump here in here and point out it, it is 830 uh, for anybody who does need to uh, jump off. Uh, please don't hesitate to jump off. And we did decide beforehand that we would go an extra 15 minutes if necessary to get through questions. So I'll keep uh, plugging away here. Uh, Neil Ritchie, uh, great presentation, Stuart. You mentioned cross laminated timber construction as being more sustainable than steel and concrete, question mark. Is it more costly than using traditional materials? Do costs vary by region in the country? And there's one more question, but I'll let you answer those two first. Um, uh, does cost um, vary by region? Um, I, well, I guess, first of all, is it more costly, the cross laminated timber construction compared to steel and concrete? So that's sort of question one. Um, okay, so let's be real clear. Um, right now, you cannot use mass timber in a hospital, in a hospital. Um, you, um, and even, um, uh, there are some, um, occupancies like say a long-term care facility you mentioned, um, uh, that one, which, um, depending on which region you're in, um, it is, uh, you cannot use mass timber. But that's starting to change in that what we're seeing with more mass timber construction just sort of happening um, is that it is it it uh, uh, authorities having jurisdiction so building departments are now much more aware of um, uh, the opportunity and are looking at while the code necessarily has, hasn't changed they're looking at equivalencies and they are um, starting to in certain instances allow that so um we're, i don't believe um that we're going to see uh, mass timber in an acute care facility go out on a limb here we're definitely not i don't think we're going to see it in the next sort of five years ten years i don't know maybe perhaps um it depends on sort of how technology evolves so just to kind of put that one in the context, because we're talking about hospitals um, specifically. Um, I, although I, uh, we are seeing it start to get applied in um, non-acute care, is it more expensive? Um, I'm just thinking of, uh, of a recent project, I think, uh, and, it, and it was in British Columbia, um, and there was a real, um, the, I mean, the government um, wants to promote mass timber construction 
um, they're engaged in that discussion around reducing embodied carbon. Um, dollar for dollar, yeah, it was uh, more expensive. I can't, you know, as a percentage. And I think um, right now, uh, because of the pandemic, honestly, costs are um, kind of all a little um, all over the map. True. And it's a hey, look, I'm going to I'm just going to move along. I think it. you addressed most of the questions there uh, from anonymous. What recommendations does Stuart have for rebuilds and recommissioning projects and how clinicians can move the needle? Um, I, mean, I think you probably covered some of that, but if you just want to sort of summarize what you think a clinician can do to influence some of these things. Um, I, I, I think I'd maybe go back to kind of, um, you know, the conversation that Anita and I just, the question that she asked, and I think it's get involved as early as possible. So it's, it's you know, back at stage one. Um, and, you know, back at stage one, I think would be um, when a project is, is first being sort of thought of and a facility and an organization already having some kind of position on sustainability and where it sees itself ultimately in, in um, I think, meeting that responsibility. And I guess that's kind of a question. Does, you know, do hospitals feel that responsibility that they ought to be leaders in sustainability and the promotion of health and wellness? Uh, and how broadly maybe, you want to sort of take that, yeah. Maybe, Miles, I can just give an example of how clinicians sure, sure. yeah, can great. get involved. So, um, so after reading a few guidelines papers on uh, the HVAC operating systems and the OR, so uh, Stuart showed a picture of the OR and we have our ORs running at 20 air exchanges per hour, regardless of whether there's an operation or not. I just walked down to the facility directors and knocked on their door and had them take a tour. And they immediately noticed several things in our OR, no occupancy lights. Um, there's a, we, we actually have the ability to do setbacks, interestingly, but they weren't being done. So it's, I really think we need to engage more with our facilities directors or managers, get to know them, get to know what they do because we work in our silos. They don't know what we do and we don't know what they do. When they came up, they said, you don't need this running 24 hours. And I said, no, some operating rooms want run two hours a day. So it, it's a matter of transfer of information and conversations. And I think as clinicians who are interested in population health, the health of our communities, we do have to take the time to do that. A, a hospital that has a sustainability office, you could do that through. But if you don't, as clinicians, we have a voice, just knock on someone's door. That's a great example. And if you remember that graph that I showed of the hospitals in Ontario, that was the primary uh, differentiator as, as uh, Ian had sort of let me in on. He said, you know, just uh, it was the, it was the, I call, I put the term aggressiveness on it. It was that sort of like, I'm going to try and save money or save energy and save money. Right. And I guess that's the sort of other side that I think, um, sometimes has been a little bit of a challenging and it may kind of go a little bit to the, you know, hospitals are kind of pretty complex ecosystems and it's maybe sometimes a little bit easier for facilities to, to be over here and for clinicians to be over here and leadership and executive to sort of be over here. Um, but I think, you know, just as you say, knocking on the door and having the conversation starts to bring that communication and awareness. Okay, we have one more question. I think Caitlin's still on the line. Thanks for waiting, uh, Caitlin. Um, as discussed tonight, sustainable healthcare can mean a lot of things. As an individual trying to push a sustainability agenda in the organization, what are some of the key areas to focus on, i.e. the top three biggest bang for your buck? Hmm. And uh, we've uh, spent actually a lot of time on this, but Stuart, I'll uh, let you... Yeah, I'm going to, uh, you know, the, I think, um, I think energy, you know, uh, direct energy usage, 
um, really still remains sort of the, uh, the, the biggest kind of um, challenge. Um, and, and sort of the, the question is, um, you know, um, I think it ought to be, you know, so we can reduce energy. And then how is that, where's that energy, you know, is that, is that natural gas fired? Is it, is it carbon effectively producing energy sources that we're, that we're using? Um, could it be all electric and hydro and then, you know, a greener sort of um, uh, energy production and less greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, et cetera. I think, but it's, I'm going to sort of target it right there. Okay. Um, so Caitlin, just uh, um, for your information, uh, we've been working on a, a Coles notes for um, leadership, uh, actually the coalition and uh, Peach, we've been putting this thing together. We're really only a week or two away from sending out a draft. So if you want to uh, email any one of us, whether it's the coalition or Peach and, and give us your email, and we'll send that to you to look over this summer and see what you think. But we think the first thing is that your leadership needs to have a goal and needs to have a person in charge of sustainability. Uh, as Stuart says, energy is super important, especially in a facility like a hospital. So having an energy manager is key. Um, procurement, again, is just a huge part of the puzzle. So getting your hospital or your um, procurement agency to have a uh, waiting uh, scoring that includes sustainability is important. And then the final thing I'll add, you asked for three, but this is four, uh, choosing wisely. So being a choosing wisely uh, facility, because, you know, of course, that's getting into uh, pharmaceutical choices and tests and uh, potentially anesthesia as well, I would say. So look, we're, uh, is there any more questions there? No. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And thank you so much, Stuart, for a great presentation and some great answers. And uh, we will be back in September. I think the next webinar will be on waste management, and it will be hosted by the uh, coalition. So have a great summer. Anything else uh, Autumn or Anita wants to say before we go? No? OK. I'll just say, I'll just say yep. thank you to everyone as well for coming today and for sticking around for the questions. and. Thank you, Stuart, for being here and presenting. It was very interesting um, to hear what you had to say. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Have a great summer, everybody. Yeah. Good night.